Cheryl Woodruff has been working for and in the village since 2005. She currently serves as the Community Development Director of the Washington Square Park Conservancy. Previously, she worked for Village Preservation, the Paley Center for Media, the Connecticut Historical Society, and the Nathan Hale Homestead. From 2008 to 2013, she served on the board of the Remember the Triangle Fire Coalition and currently serves on the board of the Neighborhood Preservation Center. Cheryl holds, holds a BA from Boston University and an MA in History from the University of Connecticut. So Cheryl, I'm gonna turn this over to you. Great, thank you so much, Ariel. Um, it's really my pleasure to be here tonight. Um, as uh, Ariel mentioned, I am a past staff member over at Village Preservation. So um, I was there for almost 10 years. I'm just scrolling through the uh, folks who are here tonight. I recognize some names from programs uh, uh, in the past at Village Preservation. Um, so it's always interesting for me to come back. So thank you. Um, and of course, I love talking about Washington Square Park. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the Conservancy, we are a friends group that pa partners with the New York City Parks Department. We provide um, through uh, grants uh, to the Parks Department staffing, so gardening staff, maintenance staff, as well as direct support, um, such as volunteering programs, arts grants, and community programs. And then we'll do um, some things like this. Um, usually all of our programming is in the park. Um, while it is a safer place to go, there are limits um, from the New York City Parks Department about permitted events and um, gathering uh, folks so it takes away from other folks' ability to use the um, outside and get into the park. So um, for now, we are uh, online um, as well. Um, so thank you for being here tonight. Um, very, uh, very quickly, um, Ariel um, uh, uh, said she would uh, monitor the chat for me and the questions is a little bit too much. I still need notes um, and to move uh, my slides along. So um, uh, if you could keep your questions uh, to the end, but she will give me a recording if we don't get to something or if there's a specific question, I will, I will take the time afterwards to respond to everything. So um, tonight uh, we'll be talking about Washington Square Park past and present, we're really focusing on landscape and design. Um, so we might gloss over some things that you're interested in and I'll invite you to come to our website or some of our virtual programming to learn more about specific topics. So tonight we'll really think about the park and the land before it was a park. We'll talk about the parks department's renovations over time of this space. We'll talk about the central fountain space um, and not just one, but two controversies uh, over, over the fountain and, uh, and, and its spot in the park. Um, and we'll look at, uh, uh, as we go, some, some ideas from past renovations that have shown up in, uh, in the current design that we're looking at today. Um, before we get started though, I thought it would be fun to do just a short poll. Um, I wanted to get a sense of what design everybody remembers best about the park. Um, Ariel, if you could launch that poll, or I might, oh, perfect, thank you. Um, so you can only select one. So pick the earliest design you remember. So it's current design, which took place between 2007, 2014. Um, you remember maybe the circa 1990s when the dog runs were added. Um, you remember maybe the park when it was first renovated in 1970, or some of you might even remember the park before 1970 and when it was close to traffic. So just um, if you can give it another, um, another couple of seconds there, Ariel, and just give people time. You bet. <laughs> Thanks, you'll know better than me when to close it and launch the results. And I appreciate you're doing the back end for me, Ariel. You're a, <laughs> you're oh, a champ. Of course, of course. <laughs> I think I think we're good. I'm okay. Gonna, I'm gonna um, share the share the results. Great. Ah, so um, so most people only remember the park with its current design at 33 percent. We have the next highest, um, remember the park when it was first renovated in 1970. All right, excellent. 26% uh, 20 the dog runs, that makes sense. And only 11% remember when it was closed to traffic, good for you. 
Um, so my little secret, um, and this is very embarrassing to admit um, with my current role uh, at, as the community development director, is I barely remember the park before it was renovated now. I moved to the city in 2000. I'm a, I'm a newbie um, by a lot of people's uh, reckoning. Um, uh, and I started working for Village Preservation in 2005. And I didn't spend a lot of time in the village from 2000 to 2005 because I would always get lost. <laughs> so, um, so as we're, we're ta uh, talking, it'll be interesting to see what you all remember. Um, but what I can promise you is that none of you, myself, anyone on this, on this uh, uh, virtual Zoom lecture, remembers the park before Europeans came here. Um, so um, it was still, it still had some landscaping, um, but, um, but uh, it was not, it was not designed per se. So you're looking at um, what is a newer map, not quite new, newer map um, with course of Mineta Stream uh, going through Washington Square Park, starting up at um, 16th, 15th Street um, for one leg and another leg starting up at 20th Street, um, 21st Street, kind of combining together around 11th Street. Um, and uh, so for those of you, uh, for those of you at um, Fifth Avenue and 11th Street, um, you're right at the center of this, that fork of the two Mineta streams coming together. And then entering the park really west of where the fountain is today, um, exiting just to the east of the western corner um, and going out. And the reason why I like to talk about Mineta stream is because it really sets up what the landscape looked like naturally. So, um, the, the area was lush, you know, a stream, marshland um, around it, and then kind of like a little bit of higher, a um, little bit of higher uh, uh, meadows to the east and west um, uh, of the stream. It was used by the Lenape uh, Indians, uh, and they basically used the stream for sustenance. The Lenape weren't uh, settled folks, so they had different settlements that they would go through throughout the year, um, according to you know, the seasons. And this was near a Lenape, one of the Lenape set settlements, you know, seasonal settlements, um, close to uh, a trail, um, Broadway, um, which, was, uh, which was a Lenape trail. And, um, and really teeming with life. So anytime you have a stream here, it's um, you're going to have you know water to drink. You're going to have animals and uh, birds flocking that you can then kill and eat. Um, and so this area was very very lush. Um, and as the Dutch settlement at the tip of Manhattan in the 1620s starts <laughs> begins. Um, basically moving from what is uh, a company town of the Dutch West India Company uh, to the colony of uh, New Amsterdam, this area really becomes a site of conflict with the Lenape. Um, under uh, New Amsterdam's Director General Willem Keefe, um, from 1643 to 1645, there were a series of uh, skirmishes with the Lenape and the Dutch uh, called now Keith's War, um, which really helped uh, unite the Al regional Algonquin tribes of which the Lenape were part. Um, and this area really became a, a, a kind of a spot where uh, border wars uh, kind of took place. Uh, I don't wanna say border wars, but um, skirmishes uh, took place. So, um, so this area is really um, is really interesting in who meets here, um, but it's also interesting because it is a natural place for people to come together because of what the stream brings. So um, from as the as the settlement uh, grows um, in New Amsterdam, uh, this area becomes farmland, um, and I think who farms this land is incredibly interesting. So um, basically uh, the land is given, started by William Keefe to people I have termed half free slaves. And I use the term half free is because they had certain legal rights. They themselves were free 
uh, they uh, could sue, so they could use the courts. Um, they uh, they could own property, so they owned, you know, say cattle or hogs, um, and um, they were given as land grants by the Dutch West India Company to company slaves, not to just, you know, regular people slaves, but to the company slaves. Um, and Washington Square Pi Park is the site of uh, two uh, land grants. The top um, kind of cross hatched or like squared off area um, in the park's northeast corner um, was uh, given to a man named Manuel Trumpeter, um, and that's in 1643. And the land uh, to the south that just abuts Mineta, which is that big, uh, which is that big uh, line going through kind of the uh, northwest section of the park. That land is given in 1645 to a former slave named Anthony Portuguese. Now I told you I used the phrase half free. Um, and I say that because while they had certain um, freedoms, their children weren't free. Um, and this was, uh, you know, a particular bone of contention between uh, this population and the Dutch West India Company. Um, and they also were required to give a certain amount of their farm goods to the company each year. Now, you know, New Amsterdam was really formed as, um, as, a, as a trading colony. Um, so beaver and flour and the like. Um, so um, there wasn't much farming going on. Um, and so this helped feed the colony, um, these land grants. You know, people can think that, oh, maybe it was paternalistic, maybe it was a nice thing to do. Um, it also could have been a, a way to create a little bit of a border between the town at the tip of Manhattan and the Lenape. Um, so um, I always like to imagine what it would be like to be Anthony Portuguese or Manuel Trumpeter and where your sympathies would lie. They would lie with the company, um, if it would lie with the Dutch, um, or if it would, uh, or if it would lie with, um, with the natives. Um, I can uh, imagine um, that, uh, I can imagine that it would be wherever there they were most, uh, they, they, they received the most. Um, and actually, many of the company slaves were given weapons uh, to fight against the natives. So um, it's just a kind of very interesting thing to think about this landscape. This was very lush land. Remember, this is abutting a, a, you know, a natural stream. So you had a very close water source. Um, and uh, you know, these were really meadows um, here to the uh, east of the, of the park. So I imagine that well, really tough work because it hadn't been farmed before. Um, this was really a uh, this was really a lush land to to farm. So we're going to skip over a lot of years here. Forgive me, but um, uh, England basically takes over what is the colony of New Amsterdam, or um, in 1664. Um, and the last director general, Peter Stuyvesant, kind of sees the writing on the wall. Um, he concedes without a fight. So New York, um, the English enter New Amsterdam and eventually becomes New York. Um, and really um, the area around Washington Square Park remains farmland, really a really not even a suburb, but you know, outer lands um, from the city proper. Um, and um, by the by the, you know, by the mid 1700s, there's more and more um, kind of gentlemen farmers coming and, and taking and buying land here. Um, you know, we know that um, descendants of Anthony Portuguese actually held on to farmland through the early 1700s. Um, and after that, the, the record um, gets a little murky. Um, but so, so slowly uh, um, it turns from really what, what's been called the land of the blacks to, um, to farmland for uh, the English. Um, by, we're gonna again, skip over a lot of time here, but um, following, uh, following the Revolutionary War, um, the, the city is growing. It's um, growing farther north. And really at this point, um, by the time by, by the time the 1700s changed to this, uh, the 1800s, um, there is in need of land for burying the dead. Um, so wash, what is now Washington Square Park uh, becomes um, a potter's field. 
And um, you can see um, uh, in this uh, slide here, um, the boundary of the uh, potter's field is in the dots and there's the, the key or the, on the left. Um, and you can see um, some, um, some interesting uh, kind of overlaps here. Uh, number two is, uh, is a uh, keeper's house. It's not built right away, um, but um, there is a keeper of the potter's field's house located within the park. Um, there's an abutting cemetery. So the Scotch Presbyterian uh, Church, which is nearby, has a cemetery that you can see it kind of uh, not only abuts, but it um, lands in the potter's field. Um, and so um, if any of you were around in 2015, 2016, and the water main project taking place on Washington Square East, they discovered uh, vaults uh, in, you know, graves in vaults um, beneath the street bed there. That was really the, um, the Scotch Presbyterian Cemetery and they discovered it, but, you know, the city has known it's been there. Uh, <laughs> so um, the, um, you'll also see number one, um, you'll see Mineta is again in our, in our view and you can see the, um, you can see the line there. Um, the potter's field ran up to Mineta. The land to the west was private property, um, a man named Ludlow. And you can see there are several buildings um, on his property. And what I think is really interesting um, about, um, about this is uh, one, one of the uh, kind of pieces of landscape, we'll talk about it in a few minutes, that is still um, extant in Washington Square Park is part of uh, Ludlow's property. So we'll get there. Some of you might be able to guess what it is. So the Potter's Field opens in uh, 1797. Um, there is various work done on the Potter's Field and we know from records from the uh, city's, uh, uh, the Common Council or what we need call now the New York City Council. Um, we know that there, uh, uh, there was a, um, um, that there was a fence added. Um, we know that there were several grave robberies. We know that the, uh, the dead were buried in trenches. So they weren't necessarily buried in graves. They were buried in long trenches. And a potter's field is meant to bury people without means. Um, but the potter's field was also created at a time when yellow fever epidemics start hitting the city. And um, without a lot of knowledge of germs and how they're spread, um, the, the idea that someone could catch yellow fever from the dead also arose. And so there were burials in the park, um, or excuse me, in the potter's field that became the park, um, that, uh, that uh, were burials with people with means. Um, and during the last renovation, a headstone actually was uh, recovered um, from during this time. So, okay. So I, I like to show um, I like to show this because it really kind of shows that the the Potter's Field really had very similar boundaries to what Washington Square Park became. Um, the there are estimated up to twenty thousand bodies um, that were buried in the Potter's Field. Um, it's um, and by 1825, it was starting to fill up. And I also think there were some other pressures um, to close the potter's field. And you'll, you'll, um, you'll see that in a, in a minute. Um, but um, the, the field closes in uh, 1825. And even before then, um, in the 18, uh, in the 18, early, late, 18 teens, uh, the city starts taking a number of efforts to start directing Mineta underground. Um, so a series of sewers, culverts were built. And by 1826, the, um, um, the, the park opens as a parade ground. And by 1827, people are really thinking of it as Washington Square Park. Now I have never found the first reference to the name, um, but Washington uh, Parade Ground and then Washington Square Park um, happens in fairly quick succession. Um, the, the city, and I'm just gonna go 
back a minute, the city purchases the land to the west of Mineta and creates basically the shape of the park as you see it now. Um, so the basically the, the four corners um, across the, the streets that you think of today. It was 6th Street and 4th Street. Now we think of it as Washington Square North and Washington Square South, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, McDougal, obviously, um, et cetera. Um, the, we don't know too, too much about the original designs before this, but this is a very formal plan. And this is, oops, excuse me, this is from the Parks Department. But we do have this record from 1851. Now it's a painting. Um, and so the, you know, it could be skewed a little bit, but um, we, uh, we do know that, uh, that it was used as a parade ground. This is, the, uh, this is the seventh regiment on review, which is a painting. It's by, excuse my German, Otto Botticher. Um, which is at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Um, and in the description, when you go into their collection, it says they are located right now, they're practicing in the northwest corner of the park. Um, this is like, so we're looking west to east, and this is very confusing because it looks like the park is huge. <laughs> um, so I'm not sure if it's, you know, an artist's uh, kind of bird's eye view um, or if they were taking up more of the park. Uh, but you can see some of these more formal type paths um, that was indicated in the plan from the, uh, from the parks department. Um, so, when the, uh, so when the parks department, excuse me, when the city created a park or a parade ground from a potter's field, they extended, they created the borders, they added fencing all around. There was already a wooden fence uh, around uh, the potter's field, they extended it. There was no removal of bodies. The, uh, there was infill brought in and there's records where uh, the regiments, when they were, uh, when they were parading, um, in the paper you see um, that uh, ground was broken and they could see remains like when a cannon had like gone into, into the ground. So, um, <laughs> so uh, the, the, the bodies are still with us um, and every once in a while they, they, they do emerge and we'll talk about the current renovation. There was actually an archaeology study done um, to make sure that remains weren't being, um, weren't being disturbed during that renovation. And I did note about that northwest corner of Ludlow property that there was one remaining piece of landscape um, that, that has been in the park before it was a park. And that is the English elm that stands in the northwest corner. Um, you know, when, when you go and visit it, it is mighty. This is a picture from 1935. It's not quite as, as, as big as it is now, but um, we estimate the tree to be somewhere around 350 years old, which puts it with um, the same decade as New, New Amsterdam becoming New York. So the 1660s, um, it would put it somewhere in the 350 50 range. It's also very hard to date urban trees. So that is an estimate. So give or take, you know, 25 years on either side. <laughs> Um, so um, you'll notice in this picture, this is from 1935, but you'll notice the development uh, to the north, Washington Square North, which we're very familiar with now. And I always like to say which came first, the chicken or the egg, the changing from the potter's field to a parade ground to a park um, because, of the, because of no more space or because the city was marching north. And my guess is that it's because the city is marching north. Okay, so um, a plan from 1836, and you'll notice um, there's no development on Washington Square North, but there are plans for development at Washington Square North, and they're going to start building quite soon. Um, there is development on Washington Square South um, and along the east side as well. And you can see, and I apologize for the cross hatching, um, but I don't have too many records. Um, back here, but you can see there's still that, uh, that kind of square path around the park. And then there's the north and east-west access. But then you can see there's kind of like a square 
Um, so they've kind of added in 1836 a little bit more paths for people to walk on. So as it starts becoming less parade ground and more park for people, um, paths become kind of very um, uh, useful for, uh, for the citizenry. The, um, and I'll, I'll note here that NYU, um, which this crowd probably doesn't have a lot of love for, you can see their lot here, 2733. That is the first NYU building and it goes up in 1834. Um, and you'll get to see that building in a few minutes. Actually, probably less than a few minutes. Okay, so the 1848 plan. And again, I'm, I wanted to focus on design of the park here. You can see even more diagonal paths were added. You can see there's a space um, for um, a fountain um, in the center. Um, this uh, redes redesign per se um, was completed by a man named William Kerr. He's considered a gardener. Um, it's very formal with angular, pl um, angular plots kind of created um, here by, the, by, these, uh, by these very angular paths. Um, diagonal pass. In 1848, a, um, a wrought iron fence replaces the wooden one around the street. And also um, during this time, a uh, gas light um, was added. And very importantly, <laughs> um, very importantly, we get um, in uh, 1852, the first fountain. So why, why a fountain? Um, well, many reasons. Um, but Basically, in the 1840s, the city completes the Croton Aqueduct and it brings running water uh, to New York City. And this is an engineering feat. Um, it's, it, it's, I mean, you can think of it during a pandemic now, how horrible it would be not to have running water. Um, it really changes um, how people are able to live in the city. And so um, the nascent parks department creates fountains across city parks, including at City Hall, um, Madison Square and uh, Tompkins Square as well. And you can see this is our first fountain. I think a lot of people here already know that our arch is not the first arch, but the, uh, the fountain is um, not the first fountain. This is the first. Um, this is much bigger than uh, our current fountain. It's about 100 feet in diameter. Um, it has um, only one center decorative jet. Um, and uh, there's also, during the 1850s, besides the, the Croton Aqueduct celebration, there's also this idea of the pleasure ground movement um, in design circles. Um, it's inspired by Andrew Jackson Downing, and its idea was just to create um, uh, tranquility uh, in our public spaces, and fountains were made uh, to add to that. And I promised you, this is the same, this, this, um, the first was actually a photo uh, and this is an etching. Um, and you can see the lovely wrought fence around the fountain. You can also see the, um, you can also see the first university building here on the left and on the right is a uh, Dutch reformed church. And this is, uh, I think, one of my favorite images of the park. It is from 1856. It's an etching by James Smiley. Um, because you get to see Washington Square South. Um, you know, the, the buildings to the south are built in the 1820s, the late 1820s. The, the north, they're a little bit more refined and grander. They were built in the uh, late 1830s. Um, but there's very few pictures of, of Washington Square South. And you know, we think of how grand the buildings are on the north side. These aren't too shabby either. So um, you know, built for a different class, a merchant class as opposed to a society class, but still quite fine. And so to think about the park um, being lined with all these, um, these fine buildings. Um, you can also see in this etching these diagonal lines through the park and you get to see what I think is a fairly um, uh, exuberant idea of how far the fountain plumed, um, but, uh, but it is certainly, um, but it is certainly uh, um, a kind of an interesting site. Um, and you can see that, that grand fence um, around, around the park as well. So 
Um, so this brings us to um, this brings us to 1870 and what becomes basically one of the most significant design changes since you know Washington Square became a park in 1827, um, Parade Ground 1826, Park in 1827, um, and really will kind of affect and have ramifications for the design for the um, for the landscape of Washington Square really for the next hundred years. Um, so I'm going to show you that plan. This is the 1870 plan, and as you can see. Um, there is a fountain in the center, um, but what you're looking at besides the paths to the east and west in the central area, you are looking at roadbed. So um, for those of you who are familiar with the, um, the, the fight to stop traffic through Washington Square in the 1950s, this really starts in 1870. And there's a lot of um, there's a lot of really um, uh, interesting characters who play a role in Washington Square Park history and Greenwich Village history. Um, but this, I think, really, um, really changes the landscape of the park. And we owe um, this, this plan to one William Boss Tweed, um, who becomes in the 1870s the first um, the first commissioner of a parks department. Now it's not the same parks department as we have now. It is, um, it's just for Manhattan, um, but he becomes commissioner. And, you know, as someone who is basically kind of now known as, as you know, for graft, um, he basically wants to extend Fifth Avenue south below to kind of bring business to, um, you know, to the businesses where he knows the owners south of the park. And so um, in 1870, we get, uh, we get a road through Washington Square. Um, what, um, what also happens, and this is a little bit later of a map, so you'll have to forgive me, but you, we, also get, um, we also get some buildings added to the park at this time. So I've circled um, all the way to the left is a music stand. Um, it's built in 1872. Um, we don't know when it's demolished. Um, the uh, the uh, police shelter in 1872 as well. Um, and it stood until at least 1970, uh, excuse me, 1939. And the ladies' cottage, um, again, built in 1872, um, it was demolished in 1968. A ladies, call, uh, a ladies' cottage is a bathroom. So um, it's very interesting to me that women got a bathroom um, and not men, but, you know, I think um, in the 1870s, also the population of the area around the square is really starting to change. There's a lot more immigrant families. Um, it might be people who uh, live in tenements as opposed to row houses lining the square. And so a restroom becomes really um, important so that there's less waste um, in a crowded park. <laughs> we have that issue still today. And I love this picture just because you can see um, uh, you can see some of the buildings in the park with that uh, uh, with the fountain um, and then that first NYU building there as well and you get this nice crosshatch and I'm not sure what building this is but here's the music stand here's the police shelter and here is the women's cottage so um, so, and you can see, um, you know, these carriages going through. What I will tell you is the community wasn't happy with the roadbed. It stopped being a roadbed by 1879. It becomes a roadbed, well, it still stays a roadbed, but used for traffic. I do not know when traffic started up again. Um, that's something I would love to find, but I haven't been able to track down. Um, so um, now we're going to talk a little bit about what I call the monument period. Now, there's no such thing as a monument period, but for Washington Square Park, it's, um, it's, uh, it's when our, all of our monuments come in. And most people like to think of the Washington Square Arch as kind of the centerpiece of Washington Square, but it was not the first monument. Actually, uh, uh, the first monument to be added is uh, that of Giuseppe Garibaldi, um, and uh, that is him on the left there. Um, in 1888, he's known as the Uniter of Italy. Um, he's sculpted by a man named uh, Giovanni Torini. 
actually served with uh, Garibaldi um, during his quest to um, to turn Italy from a you know a, an organization of city states into an actual country. Um, it's made of bronze and it's on a granite pedestal. Um, what's really interesting is I've never found why it's here. Um, you know, obviously there's if, if you're a village preservation uh, follower, you know that the South Village, uh, just below Washington Square Park, um, is really, uh, uh, excuse me, is really um, uh, an Italian neighborhood from the 1880s down uh, through the 1920s. And, uh, um, and so it was the Italian community who actually paid for Garibaldi to be placed. I read park department annual reports to see if there was any like petitioning for Garibaldi to go in this particular space. I think probably location was probably because just because of, you know, the closeness to, you know, Little Italy and the South Village, Little Italy, um, as well as the fact that there were no other monuments in this park. So um, Garibaldi, um, obviously was not always where he is now. And I think this picture by Berenice Abbott um, from the Muse Museum of the City of New York kind of shows um, it best. It's a little bit of an, a newer picture, um, not quite 1888, it's uh, from 1936, but you can see Garibaldi all the way over to the right of the image. And he's kind of looking off into a Southwest direction. Okay, so. Excuse me. Um, so uh, uh, the next, <laughs> the next uh, monument that Washington Square Park receives, um, it's dedicated in 1890. It's to Alexander Lyman Holly. Um, so Holly is credited with adapting the Bessemer process of steel making to U.S. production needs. So he didn't create the Bessemer steel production, he adapted it, but he was commissioned by, and I have to look at my notes for this one, the American Society of Mechanical Engineers and American Society of Civil Engineers. Uh, so he is made of bronze and he's on a really beautiful limestone pedestal. Um, and he was sculpted by John Quincy Ward. Um, but again, second monument is to someone that most people don't really think about today. Um, just to be, I, I don't mean to be unkind to Holly, but you know, he's not necessarily a well-known name. Um, so finally, um, this is 1890, two years later, um, or really at the same time, we get the, we get the centennial arch uh, for uh, Washington's commemoration of Washington as um, the first president. Um, in 1892, they start um, groundbreaking on the Washington Square Arch, and this is an image from 1905 before the Washington statues are added. Um, and uh, it's completed in 1892, and it's dedicated in 1895. Um, you know, we could spend all day uh, talking about the arch, and if you are interested, we do have some uh, recorded lectures on our website um, about the arch, and we're going to be doing a uh, talk in a, I think it's about three weeks or two weeks uh, on the restoration that took place in the early 2000s. Um, but, um, you know, the arch made of Tuckahoe marble um, really created to honor our first president, George Washington, created also during the uh, City Beautiful movement. The City Beautiful movement really um, was, you know, part of landscape and architecture and design really thought that beautiful art should be in public spaces. And in some ways, I think about the arch as kind of a very nationalistic uh, endeavor. It's um, really spearheaded by a man named William Rhinelander Stewart, who lived just right off the park um, in the Rhinelander Estates um, on Washington Square North um, on the west side. Um, um, and, and, and the, and, um, undertaken by the firm of McKim, Mead and White and Stanford White as the architect. But, you know, really, um, you know, so many symbols of the founding of our country, like the Eagle, our federal seal, Washington's family seal, obviously the two um, uh, statues of Washington, which they kind of ran out of money. And so that's what took so long to get them up in 1916 and 1918. Um, but it was also created, um, you know, at this time when there's so many changes to who lives 
uh, in the United States. And while you're celebrating the centennial, thinking back on like these founding ideas, kind of teaching this new population, you know, what it means to be American. And so my favorite designer who worked on the uh, on the arch were the Picciarelli brothers, who literally like were off the boat from Italy, like as they started to work on this this, this arch and just seminal, seminal uh, sculptors who really knew how to work in marble. They crafted the rosettes uh, on the underside of the arch in place um, from blocks of marble. Um, there are uh, 90, I want to say 95 of them. I think that's correct. I always, it's 92 or 95. I think it's 95. Um, the, uh, and really, you know, really contributed so much stonework across New York City and have uh, it's been said of them that um, that you know sculptors no longer needed to learn the craft because they could sculpt in a different material and and the Pichirilli brothers could uh, sculpt stone for them so um, uh, so you know like I said we could talk about the arch for a long time but um, I do want to get on with the landscape and so we'll talk about the last monument added to Oop, added to the park, and that is the War War I Memorial Flagpole. Um, this was created in 1920. Um, White is no longer with us, but the firm McKim Mead and White designs the um, designs the base. Um, it is uh, it is it was commissioned by the Washington Square Association, and they're the folks who uh, do the tree lighting and carol sing uh, every year. And it's really to commemorate those from Greenwich Village who lost their lives in the war. Um, and, you know, there, this is its first location in, um, in 1970. It moves to where it is now just tucked to the east uh, of, of the arch. And I do want you to, um, before we move to the next slide, I do want you to just take a look at the, uh, the uh, fencing around the, uh, our current fountain um, there, just so you can get a look. Look at that. Um, it's um, before we go um, into our into our next section, which again we're going to talk about another name that really had a huge influence on the park. Um, to a village crowd, you know, you get boos and hisses when you say his name, but I think contributed some really great um, additions to uh, to Washington Square. And so, again, this is not a historically correct era, but I'm calling it for Washington Square Park, the Moses era. Uh, Moses is the parks commissioner um, from 1934 until 1962, among many other titles that um, he has across the city and the state. Um, in 1934, excuse me, in 1934, significantly, the parks department goes from having a, a Parks Department in each borough to having a central Parks Department um, uh, for the whole city, um, and um, and Moses is at the at the head. And I think one of his greatest contributions to Washington Square is what he did for the fountain. So in the height of the Great Depression, he added steps um, and added um, jets to make it into a waiting pool. And so here we are. Um, in this picture from uh, 1935 uh, showing um, showing this renovation and I just want to if you can really see it I should have circled it but right in the forefront here uh, these kids are sitting on the top um, pedestal there of the arch um, they're sitting on an urn um, you know that those are not there now um, and uh, they were meant to be brought back in the um, in the most recent renovation. I, I believe they were approved by the Landmarks Preservation Commission and denied by the Design Commission. Um, so, um, which I think the Design Commission uh, said that it just they 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 were a little bit too formal for how Washington Square Park has kind of been conceived. So um, the, uh, there's also a new comfort station or bathroom, uh, the Parks Department likes to call bathrooms uh, or restrooms, uh, comfort stations. Um, and Chess Plaza is added uh, to, or the chess tables are added to uh, the park at this time as well. And just to give you some context of um, what the park looked like in the Moses era, uh, there's just looking south um, to the arch, and you can see that roadbed dominating the central fountain area. 
And then this very uh, Southern um, look at the park and there's that playground um, he's had some um, behind some bathrooms uh, and buildings just at the edge of the park there. Okay, so um, I talked about Moses as being a nice guy. Here's where Moses starts getting in trouble um, in Greenwich Village. He, he develops a series of plans for, uh, for Washington Square Park, um, the first coming out in, um, in the 1930s. And um, this is, you know, we get a waiting pool, but he really envisioned a pool. Um, this is a huge change to, um, to what, you know, Washington Square would have looked like as a park. You know, so far you've seen those rectangular borders around the park have not changed if this plan went into place. And you're looking at um, the north of the park here and the south of the park here. Sorry for that change in orientation. Um, but um, you can see he, he is basically taking out the roadbed and moving traffic around the park. Um, and it's always interesting to think what would have happened if this design had gone through. Um, it would have been a much different um, park that we're in today. So, um, so he doesn't stop there. There are other plans, but I think the most notorious is the highway through the park. The park always has had a roadbed. Um, what um, what Shirley Hayes and Jane Jacobs and others argued was that um, that this was really a highway and not um, and not just a, a roadbed. And so um, the um, the plan was to um, uh, the plan was to have people above the roadbed and the roadbed below. And um, the um, the uh, the powers that be, being the Greenwich Village community, really just um, really just fights against this plan. And in 1957, um, with organizing over the course of, you know, seven years, is not only able to stop this plan, but is able to stop all traffic from going in the park. And what happens is it's a, um, an emergency, uh, emergency committee to stop all but, well, no, Joint Committee to Stop All But Emergency Traffic Through Washington Square. Um, and uh, Village Preservation has some great resources, uh, uh, oral histories of Jane Jacobs and also Shirley Hayes, who really um, worked on these campaigns. Um, but, um, you know, it was a mixture of politicking, a mixture of just, you know, grassroots organizing. And Shirley Hayes really, she was a mom um, and she just didn't want traffic through the park. And so um, first it's a closure to everything but the buses and emergency vehicles. And then slowly it just winds up being, um, being a uh, being a complete uh, renovation. So, sorry, I'm getting distracted because I'm starting to look at your questions and your chats. So, um, and that brings us to I'm just taking a look at the time because okay, we're doing good. Um, that takes us to um, the community renovation, and I say 1969 to 1970, but really, this renovation was in the works from really from you know 1960 to 1970 when they break ground. Um, the plan is led by a man named uh, Robert Nichols and um, and it's you know these 10 years there's I call it a community renovation because he was very very um, uh, like a stickler on like reaching out to the community and seeing what they thought. So this is an early plan um, for the 1970 renovation and you can see the fountain lined up in the center with the arch. It's very kind of structured um, with, you know, trees. You know, that's a central plaza that looks a little bit like a rectangle. Um, and you'll notice um, off to the um, to the right of, of the and the southeast part of Washington Square Park, you'll notice that empty space. That's where Bobst will um, open in 1973. And then a little bit, the next plan, a little bit closer to what actually happens, um, where there's a lot of kind of uh, little plazas, you know, kind of in the corners. And there's this very central um, fountain plaza circle. And there it is. This is the plan that actually got built with, um, with maybe a little less green and a little more, uh, and a little more plaza. 
Um, but this is really, the, 1970 is the first time that we can imagine the central part of the park without traffic, um, because there's no longer, um, you know, this is no longer roadbed. Um, in 1957, when, when um, uh, the Board of Standards of Appeals kind of approves the uh, plan for um, nothing but emergency traffic, the, um, the, uh, a few years later, the the Department of Transportation gifts the land to the Parks Department. So then, now this is really parkland and this is able to happen for the first time. And you can see, um, and I'm bringing this up because the fountain, whether it's centered on the arch, uh, was a very controversial um, design plan in the latest renovation. But you can see that the central fountain is, is just a little bit off to the west um, in this design. And I'll just um, go through and give you um, a few kind of items. So the central monuments or the, the, the monuments Holly and Garibaldi are moved and you can see um, mid construction here. Um, here is Garibaldi off his pedestal in pieces kind of waiting as the renovation happens um, and he moves from um, he moves from uh, kind of looking off to the, the southwest and then he's looking west um, towards the center of the park in the in the 1970 renovation and when they did this um, they uncovered a time capsule uh, the parks department um, found this that was placed when it was built in 18 or erected in 1888 and uh, um, it had like newspaper clippings of the um, of you know of the kind of the raising the money and then the celebration um, and some other items. Um, unfortunately, the Parks Department does not know where it is now. Um, one day I think we'll find it though, but it's always fun for me to see renovations um, in place. Um, and here is that central fountain. So um, what happens is the, the, the fountain takes a series of, of grade changes um, so that you go down um, into the fountain. Um, it retains the steps. And I just do want to point out uh, the uh, the lights um, from the Central Fountain Plaza are the lights that are now what we call Fountain Plaza, the area, they are very similar to what was there um, in this renovation now. So the mounds area was created. And for those of you who like me mostly remember the park as it is now, um, you'll see that um, you'll see that uh, there was play equipment on it and it actually looked, you know, fairly sturdy um, and not so bad. Um, and there was a series of kind of low kind of architectural walls uh, added across the park. Um, you know, very kind of 70s architecture um, when you think about it. Unfortunately, they became um, places where uh, folks could hide. So, you know, as the park went into, and the city went into um, less easy times, um, it was uh, uh, it was a great place for drug dealers or drug users to kind of crouch behind or, you know, to use the bathroom or to, to use drugs, et cetera. So, um, okay. And then again, that this, central area or the southern areas. We have the stage, we have what was called Teen Plaza, and we have a Patonk Court. And so uh, it felt maybe a little like a lot of paved area um, and maybe not quite enough green. So, all right, that takes us to <laughs> um, our 20th, our 21st century renovation. Technically, um, the plans for this were um, were really in the early 2000s. Um, there were a series of lawsuits brought um, by people in the community about, you know, things that they did or did not want to see as part of the renovation, whether process was um, uh, was done correctly by the city, et cetera. So the dates are 2007 to 2014, and the park was um, uh, renovated in a um, in three phases. So um, parts of the park opened before other parks, you know, they closed one part and then opened another. Um, and the center was the first 
completed, and that was completed by, I think it was 2009 or 2010. So um, you might remember that central plaza being open earlier, and you are correct. Um, but, you know, 30 years is really, or longer, 35 years is really a long time to go um, between renovations. And there were some additions put in, kind of work done piecemeal. Um, there was a small dog run added, a large dog run added in the 90s. Um, and there were some problems with, you know, kind of just some, some pieces that were really kind of falling apart. And some people argued um, during the kind of the community um, kind of reaction phase of the design. Some people said, oh, the park doesn't need a redesign. It just needs to be fixed up in certain areas. Um, but I really think this renovation um, uh, really uh, does some real justice to past landscape design, but also um, really kind of brings things into what we think of as what a 21st park should have amenity wise. Um, and this was uh, uh, created, the design was created by George Volonikis. He was the landscape architect behind it. And, um, and I will mention that he is a former park administrator and our former executive director. Um, so just a, you know, <laughs> uh, my former boss. Um, so um, I just wanted to show you just some of those existing conditions um, before, um, before we get to the actual renovation. So you can see some of the problem areas if you, like me, don't really, really remember the park. And um, you can see here um, on the, um, the left-hand side, um, the, the stairs going into the fountain area had been paved over. Um, there was a lot of issues with the paving and uh, the grading, um, even on where people walked, which is, you know, it can be an unsafe condition. Um, there were areas that like weren't well used. Um, you can see, I mean, obviously there's garbage, like there's a bag of garbage, you know, in between the benches and, and the dog run fencing here. But um, it's also, there's not a lot of room for plantings and the like. And you'll see the dog runs are really added kind of to the center of the park. And that's really like where you think people are going to gather and be together. Um, and, you know, the, the park has to fit a lot of different uses. We counted in 2015, 12 million users or visits a year. Um, and that's really a lot of people for 9.75 acres. So um, you'll see the mounds were really in disrepair. The, um, the uh, playground equipment had gone away um, a, a number of years before. Um, there was continual flooding issues um, over uh, at the dog run. Um, the dogs look pretty happy, but um, it's quite messy. Um, so here it is. Here is the um, here is the 21st century um, renovation. Um, so I just kind of want to talk a little bit about some of the goals of 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 this renovation and and what it accomplished. Um, so um, you can see um, that I think. The biggest change is the fountain aligns with the arch. Now we know, or you know now from this lecture that um, the first fountain added in 1852, there was no arch at the time. So there's not really going to be a thinking of, of how these two kind of compare. Then we get the roadbed. And so the roadbed really kind of displaces the, um, the fountain. The fountain moves to one side and kind of the road takes dominance. Um, and in the 1970 renovation, there's this really nice center plaza. The only issue is um, ADA compliance. So to kind of go down a grade, you can't, um, you can't, uh, you can't make it to like r ramps have to be very long um, according to the ADA. And that's passed in 1990. We've been celebrating its anniversary this past month. Um, so this renovation has to pay close attention to, um, to the ADA and making sure that this, um, that the park is accessible. Um, so um, I really enjoy, and again, thanks to George Volonikis for sharing these, but I always enjoy seeing the park under construction. Um, you can see the, the area being kind of um, pulled out for the fountain. So it's not just aesthetics that, um, that you know, are needed to be done in this renovation and aligning it. It goes 22 feet to the east um, to align with the arch. It's, um, it's also, um, there's also things that need to be 
done. So the pipes need to be replaced. Um, and, you know, when I say the park is a built environment, um, you know, there's a lot of structure underneath as well. And so that's why I like to show these photos because you think about, you know, all the pipes, all the sprinkler for the fountain, all this, uh, and for the water fountains, um, for the sprinkler system that's there. Um, the um, water main pipes are underneath the park. Things like you know, electrical um, is underneath the park. So all these things that um, are part of this built environment. Um, another um, idea um, about centering the fountain on the arch was really to create these view corridors. Um, and you can see here, um, and I'm just gonna point out um, the, the side jets on the fountain are really meant to emulate the, um, uh, the um, fountain, um, when it was a wading pool. And here we go. You can really see that, like that north-south corridor here. You can really see how this is really, can be a great gathering space. And this is a new photo taken by one of our volunteers during one of the recent protests in the park. And it can really support all these people um, and leave a lot of room, despite being a small park for other uses um, outside of the Central Fountain area. And then there's also, um, there we go, there's, uh, there's view corridors from uh, the west to the east, so from 6th Avenue um, in winter, not so much in, uh, in full summer when all the leaves are branched out, but um, you, can see, um, you can see the fountain um, on. And um, I apologize to the volunteers who are planting in this photo. I always say I'm not gonna take pictures of them bending over, and I did, and I used it. So I'm sorry, volunteers. I think I saw one of them on as, a, um, as attending, so my apologies. Um, and then also um, the view corridor from east to west as well. So from Broadway, um, again, in winter, not in summer when the, the trees are leafed out. But you can also see that there is more green space uh, in this renovation um, from the 1970 renovation. And it's about a 20% increase in unpaved green space. Um, from 1970 to this current renovation. And you can see, you can see those lights looking like the 1970 lights. Um, we also, for the first time, get one building in the park as opposed to multiple. And this is the footprint of past buildings in the park. It's also because it's kind of tucked in, um, it feels a little bit less intrusive and it's meant to. It is a LEED certified, LEED Platinum certified building by BKSK Architects um, who really thought long and hard about the materials being used. Um, the stone that you see on the outside is from, um, is from a local uh, quarry. Um, the, um, the building is, has geothermal heating and cooling, meaning the, um, there's a, a system. I'm not the best, per, I'm not an engineer. I'm not the best person to describe this, but basically um, they, they tap into um, the ground um, to provide heating and cooling. And it's really, on, except on the hottest days and the coldest days, it doesn't, it feels fairly, um, fairly uh, uh, neutral in there. And so this space houses an office for um, the park staff. It ha houses the bathrooms. Um, there are, there's a men's, a women's, and a family bathroom. And then there's also storage um, kind of tucked um, near the entrance to the log large dog run, which here they are, all happy and playing. This is the large dog run. And um, you know, this is kind of on the street, but it's also, you can access it from the street. So um, when the park closes, you actually still have access technically to the dog runs. Um, and if your, your dog is a little bit skittish and you just wanna get into the run, you don't have to bring uh, your dog into the park. And then um, I think kind of the final central, um, final, Final area I want to talk about is very interesting because it wasn't part of the uh, uh, Mr. Volonikis's, the landscape designer's um, original plans, but was really fought very hard for by the community. Um, we, you know, we knew it in the 1970 renovation as the mounds. It's been reimagined as what's called play hills. And so instead of starting at grade and then going up, they go below grade and then undulate. And again, there is play, play equipment like there was um, on the original um, mounds, um, but the play hills are composed of a soy 
materials. So it's, it's basically fake grass. Um, it is brushed, um, cleaned, um, and uh, it's hard to keep clean because it is so popular. So I kind of love um, this kind of idea of, you know, this feature that wasn't really part of the original plan, but the community was very um, strongly adamant about, kind of became one of the, the most lo loved playgrounds uh, in the park. It's so hard to keep grass. Um, we keep um, adding sod and then we'll close off one section and the Conservancy has really tried to support that to try, just try and keep this area um, uh, as well maintained as possible with so much use. We don't wanna see what happened with the original mounds where there was no caretaking uh, happen to the play hills that are so popular. We'd like to see them continue. So really, um, uh, I think that, um, uh, these, um, this current renovation really calls to mind some of the kind of some of the older elements of past uh, landscape design here at Washington Square, um, while kind of also, you know, kind of thinking about environmental factors, more green space, thinking about bigger, like a bigger kind of more um, central place to organize and uh, kind of says like tips its hat a little bit to all those past renovations. So, um, so I have finished uh, my formal presentation. I did want to leave a little bit of time uh, for questions. Um, uh, you know, Ariel, I'm realizing we didn't even talk about a time, but I was aiming for an hour and 15, so. <laughs> That's okay. We, we, have, we have a bunch of questions. Okay. Um, Great. They're, they're all pretty short questions and they're okay. all very interesting. Okay. So. <laughs> All right. Um, hopefully, I know them. <laughs> yes, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna go go through them in order, I guess. And if, okay, if, if we get if we get tired, we can you know call, call it. I off. can also answer offline too if anyone's really. Great, great. Um, David wants to know what is the Art Deco building behind the arch to the left. Ah, that is Two Fifth Avenue. <laughs> um, created in I think 1950. 56. Um, that's the white stone that you're seeing right now to the left. That would be 2 Fifth Avenue. Um, just had to be repointed um, in the early 2000s. Um, and oh. actually, there's a really, uh, there's actually a really interesting story about that building because um, there are the that building actually lines Washington Square Park North on the west side of Fifth Avenue. Um, when it was being created, and this is another kind of um, thank you to Robert Moses that we have for Washington Square. Um, he actually also did a really good job keeping NYU um, from building too tall of buildings to the south end, but he also, because Two Fifth Avenue was meant to abut the park. And so the buildings that look like look like townhouses, I'm saying quote unquote, because when you look at them closely, you're like, these are weird. Um, they, um, they actually, that is Robert Moses who asked the developer um, who really believe, I mean, you can say bad things about him, but he also really believed in park space, you know, like all the different parks that he opened and created and, and the like and the beaches. Um, he felt that a building shouldn't um, shouldn't have like to the lot line right up against a park, and so we have him to thank for keeping to, uh, Two Fifth Avenue slightly like at you know at the same height as Washington Square North on the east side of the park, and then going higher behind. So <laughs> that's probably a longer answer than you were expecting. <laughs> I, I appreciate that information. Um, so we've had a couple of people ask questions about the stream. Yes. Um, does the underground stream still run under the park? And is there a, is there a place where that stream is visible? Okay. So um, the, um, <laughs> the, uh, it has been, so Two Fifth Avenue, again, used to have something in its lobby where you could see like the stream bubbling up, but like it renovated the lobby fairly recently or in like the last decade or so and they got rid of it. Um, folks from the NYU Law School will often say like they get a lot of water in the basement there and they think it's Mineta. And Village Preservation has done a number of walking tours. I cannot remember the name of the guide, but where he has kind of showed where like the bed of Mineta Stream kind of is and he actually lifted up like 
manhole covers and like showed like, okay, this is like where the stream would be. Um, you know, I'm assuming it's still there. I mean, it's not, it's a natural water course, but you know, there have been so many changes to, you know, the landscape of where it is that I just don't know um, is the answer. Um, sorry, I know that's not a great answer, but um, it's not like you start digging and you're like, ooh, stream. Um, just because, you know, there's been so much grading change over time too. Um, you know, one of the things I didn't talk about in the, um, in the lecture itself was like how in the last renovation grade changes across the lawns kind of to open up sight lines. Also like to like, so you could see across, but like when you were sitting, it almost seems like you're in like, you know, a, like a secluded spot. So like if you sit in the lawn behind Garibaldi stage, you might get the feeling that you're a little more enclosed, you know? So, um, you know, those types of grading changes are, have been well thought out in every renovation, at least in the 19th and 20th century. So um, poor Minetta is probably very buried. <laughs> I would guess, I would guess that as well. Um, okay. Um, we're I'm I'm trying to sort of lump the questions together. Okay. Um, yeah. So we're getting um, we got a couple of questions about um, the like furnishings of the park. So mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. um, benches, yes or no? Mm -hmm. were, were they um, were they removed to discourage folks from sleeping there? Um, <laughs> also the also the fence around the fountain um mm -hmm. w when did that come down mm -hmm. okay so um okay so fencing and park furnishings really great questions um i'll start with the the um the fence around the fountain it came down when the fountain became a wading pool so um in 1970 the the, the fountain ceased to become a wading pool but I mean, anyone has spent like a day in the park knows that everyone just goes in it. So technically now, and it has been since 1970, a display fountain, but that kind of like spirit of people thinking about it as a place to go in, like still carries over. So like, you know, you're not going to get a ticket or a summons for going in the fountain, but technically it is a display pool. Um, so that's when the fence uh, came down around the fountain. Um, park benches are, you know, that's a, that's a really like, um, interesting question because uh, particularly in the eighties and nineties, you know, the parks department would say, or the city would say, oh, like take away benches. So homeless can't sit there, things like that. I mean, you take away benches and then nobody comes and sits. Right. So, you know, a park needs maintenance you know, it doesn't matter. And, you know, this is why the conservancy is here. You know, we saw the need for maintenance as soon as the city completed its first phase of this renovation. We already saw like garbage piling up. The city, since Bloomberg is mayor, likes to put a lot of funds into capital projects. I think it looks good also like for the, I don't mean to like say mean things about our elected officials, but it does look good when they get to like open a new park or like open a renovation. You know, it's, it's a lot less sexy to, you know, fund a maintenance person, you know, to pick up the garbage so it stays nice or to fix an, a hex paver that has come loose. Um, but that's what here, we're here for. So we think it's really exciting to do that. Um, but yeah, so the city for a time really did believe in taking away seating, um, which is just kind of nasty. Um, there, you can go online and see um, sites about like hostile architecture. Um, our current designer, uh, the, the designer for the current design, George Polonicus, just felt like people, if there, are, if there are benches, people sit. And where people sit, less things happen, right? So if you're, if you're around a lot of people, it's unlikely that someone's gonna feel, feel very comfortable doing things that they shouldn't in a park, like shooting up. Now, not that there aren't those problems in Washington Square Park still, um, but the idea is that a busy park is a safe park. So benches are a good thing. <laughs> I agree, yes. Um, <laughs> And parks are for people too, <laughs> so <laughs> we don't want to make them hostile. We want to make them open and inviting. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, 
So Garibaldi didn't change location, rather just direction. Tony yeah, he clarify. did change. He did change um, location a little bit as well. He's always been on that east side of the park, in and about where Garibaldi now is. During the last, um, in the 1970 renovation, he was. Um, I didn't talk about them, but there's formal gardens and that east-west access or east-west path of the park. Um, we call them parterres, formal formal beds, formal gardens. He was in, he was basically where that formal garden is on the east side now um, during the 1970 renovation. And um, I'm not exactly sure of the best location to give you for him. Um, uh, I think he was like kind of a little bit closer to the Central Fountain Plaza now. Mm -hmm. um, so um, yeah, he's moved a lot. And in this, you know, I assumed most, most of you were familiar with the park now, so I didn't show you a scat of pictures, but, you know, he was tucked away as well as Holly facing south, and that was really to open those sight lines um, so that, you know, um, in the 80s and the 90s, they really were places where people would hide behind them and do, you know, things that were less, less good than, you know, what we hope people will do in parks. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Um, we've gotten a lot of questions about um, the the gra the graveyard and the Potter's Field mm -hmm. elements, um, yes, and sort of like were the graves robbed is one of the questions. Mm -hmm. Will the headstones ever be displayed in the park? Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> which I know, which I know there there have also been some questions about. Um, the 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 black history of the park and sort mm -hmm. of you know what is is anything in the works to sort of mark mm -hmm. those histories mm -hmm. specifically okay so um yes there are documented grave rob robberies um when the park was a potter's field um there's a um very interesting you know you look in old papers and um where the where the keeper at the time called for a um, you know, called for a policeman, um, takes his dog, goes out into the potter's field, you know, he's living in the keeper's house, goes into the potter's field, brings a lantern, um, and like drags somebody out. Um, and that particular newspaper account notes that they were robbing the grave because they were a medical student. So they were trying to learn um, about bodies <laughs> and how they worked. Um, and it wasn't necessarily a time when you could just get cadavers. So uh, <laughs> uh, yes, there were grave robberies. Um, the second question was, rem remind me? Um, uh, about, about the headstones. Oh, yes. Okay. So in the most recent renovation, there, um, there were remains that were um, removed at the time. Um, the Parks Department has them. They Actually, they should have, have gone back into the park already, um, but they haven't. Um, I'm not sure why, uh, <laughs> but uh, it's just delays, you know, with the bureaucracy. I love the parks department, but it's a bureaucracy. Um, so that, you know, that can happen at this point, at any point. Um, they're, they're kind of ready. They have the marker. It's meant to go... Um, between um, between Washington Square West and Sullivan Street, kind of closer to the fence. Um, and it's not meant to be super, super visible, but there will be a marker that shows that there are remains that were re, um, reinterred um, there. Um, the Black History, um, the Washington Square Park Conservancy is very interested in, um, also in the last renovation, there were meant to be um, tripod signs about the history of the park in three locations. Um, those are somehow still in progress. It's 2020. Um, uh, but, and it was really, really like the, the ribbon cutting for the whole park was in 2014. So I'm not sure what's happening with those, but the Conservancy is actually trying to pursue um, uh, some mark. Mark, marking, signage, public art, something along those lines. We're very early in the process, so I don't want to get, you know, too in, into detail about what we're thinking, but the Parks Department seems um, eager right now to take on projects like this, so we're hoping to see um, some type of marker, especially like for those who farmed. So the, the slaves I mentioned, the former slaves I mentioned, half-free, former, however you want to designate them, Manuel Trumpeter and Anthony Portuguese, 
um, and um, which may be part of a larger signage project just about the land of the blacks. So exciting. Yeah, it is <laughs> exciting. Um, Arthur wants to know, was the current fountain a recycled piece from Grand Army Plaza? Ah, uh, very, very good question. Yes, it was an exciting, it was a reused piece. Um, love adaptive reuse. Not from Grand Army Plaza though, but from the bottom of Central Park. So what I didn't tell you is um, when William, just for time, um, William Boss Tweed, um, when he wanted the roadbed, took out the 100 foot diameter um, uh, fountain, you know, the city had a whole plan to have um, the architect Jacob Ray Mould, um, who is known for, you know, Bethesda Terrace area of Central Park, as well as the dairy, um, create a new fountain. But then there was a national recession. There wasn't enough money. So they took this fountain from the bottom of Central Park. And that's, um, that's where we get our current fountain, which is supposedly designed by Jacob Ray Mould. So <laughs> we got a, we got a Mould uh, uh, fountain, just not the one we expected in the 1870s. <laughs> um, great. Let's see, let's Thank see. you so much for organizing all the questions. I really oh appreciate yeah, this. of course. Um, yes, she did. Um, <laughs> Oh, Jeffrey wants to know, has the paving outside the park been completed? Oh, the paving outside the park is completed. So the paving is completed. There are meant to be new street trees. Those street trees have not um, been placed yet. They were supposed to go in this spring um, pandemic. Um, so the other thing is new street trees need a lot of care and attention and the, the, the project will place the trees, but they won't water them. Now that's not technically part of the park. The, the sidewalk around the park is not part of the park. I know that's crazy. Um, but <laughs> I, was, I was like, what? When I first started working for the Conservancy, but um, it, it is managed by DOT and they don't come in water. So we were going to have a volunteer watering uh, <laughs> a program uh, when they got placed and like we were ready, like we were kind of all set to go and then pandemic. So hopefully we'll be able to work with the Department of Design and Construction, which um, has the money for those funds and get those trees in. Hopefully, I mean, you can't I'm put them in in summer, maybe this fall or next spring. So. Mm -hmm. um, I think if it's okay, I'm gonna call it. Okay, yeah, that's with, good. With, with one last question from Liz, who if okay. you're still here, hi Liz. Hi Liz. Um, <laughs> well, how about a statue for Jane Jacobs in the park? Oh, yeah. Um, you know, I would argue that a statue in the park, if there was going to be a statue in the park, it would be for Shirley Hayes, because she is really the person who got traffic stopped through the park. Now, Jane Jacobs was helpful, but it was Shirley Hayes' plan from the start. And um, like, to me, she is the towering figure of kind of creating a car free park in Washington Square. And that to me is so significant. Um, yeah, you know, Parks Department does not like to do new monuments. Um, I was really surprised when I started talking to them about doing something marking, um, marking Land of the Blacks, like they seemed kind of open. So um, I think if the if the subject matter is right, there might right. be, or if there's enough groundswell to it. But um, if someone wants to start a campaign, I'll definitely listen. And if the community wants it, then the Conservancy will help. <laughs> <laughs> I know it was a very political answer, but. <laughs> I, li I like it, I like it. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for this so much. And thank you to everyone who is still here with us. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, really great um, getting to, to talk to you all. Um, we will be sending you tomorrow um, just a kind of bonus uh, for, for, for joining us tonight. So stay tuned in your email for that. Um, if, you, if you liked this, I think you'll really enjoy um, what we're going to send you. We're going to send you the archaeology report that was uh, created right before the uh, renovation in 2005. And it's got a lot of great history. And actually, I think it has a story about that grave robbery. So. <laughs> wow, that's so amazing. That will, yeah. an that will answer a bunch of the questions that we yes. didn't get to. <laughs> yes, exactly. 
Uh, thank you so much for that. That's great. Yeah. All right. Thanks, okay. Ariel. Thanks, everyone. Everyone, thank you. Bye bye. Bye.